I always talk about, people ask me about bias and the media is so biased. And my response is, of course it is. Life is biased. You decide who, what stories you're going to cover, there's bias. You decide which reporter you're going to choose to cover the story, there's bias. She, he or she goes to write it, goes to the city desk, that editor says, well, that's not the way the world is, and makes a few little fixes. There's another level of bias. So there is a tremendous amount of checks and balances and bias in developing news stories. And judgment. You know, judgments. I mean, in, I, yeah, but I would I, tell students that, you know, okay, two sides to every story. Judgments different than bias. Uh, there are, well, by, you know, there are more than two sides, you know, and it's not sometimes sides, judgment. Fixed. It's sometimes their own personal feeling is creepy, and they may not even be aware that they're saying, "Oh, she's a blonde. She can't be too smart." I mean, they can't. They're not aware of their own thought processes at mm -hmm. times. We were there when Frank McCullough was managing editor, and and that's when so much changed because Frank really valued investigative reporting. He also would turn you loose on a story. You had to come back with um, results. And, you know, I mean, I did a series on juvenile justice and a series on nurses. Ann and I both covered health care and, um, and education. Um, and, you know, uh, <laughs> He also was extremely sensitive to women's issues and immediately sent Nancy Skelton, who was rescued, plucked out of the women's activities section, as you were, and she'd been there for eight years, and sent her over to cover the Capitol and cover the governor's office, was, which there was some grumbling about her going directly to covering the governor, who was Jerry Brown at that time, and won a lot of awards for the B during that, that period. But... Um, you know, there were major changes. There were women editors. There were no women editors other than in women's activities uh, during the early years when we were first there. And when we suggested there were that women there women on the copy desk. There were women on the copy desk. But uh, assist I remember when we suggested that there was, were qualified women to be an assistant city editor, oh. which is not a particularly lofty title, but still an important daily title. And I was in the was newsroom a, the day if, he walked through. <laughs> One, of the, well, uh, yeah. one of the top people at the B walked through the newsroom and said, women Walter, aren't... Walter P. Jones, the editor. Women aren't qualified. They don't have the gumption. To be a city editor or assistant city editor. I mean, it was just outright blatant hostility and women are stupid. And he's told that to Nancy Skelton, whom he liked and had actually intervened when she had taken a second maternity leave and they had tried to... Terminator. Terminator. And he had intervened because she had started a column, her column by mm -hmm. then, uh, mm -hmm. which made it, helped her to transition over to Metro and then to um, political writing. But so Jones, who was very, he was, must have been in his late 70s, early 80s then. I don't want to sound I was in the ageist. newsroom the night he died. Yeah. And um, he, he had a lot of... Uh, outdated ideas about journalism. Uh, we couldn't say, you know, uh, he insisted on using uh, Negro instead of black, which, you know, was... The Negro Panthers? Oh, please, get real. I mean, it was ridiculous. And, you know, we, the B, B used courtesy titles for women, as did, you know, the AP really didn't stop it until the 90s. Right. Um, but um, that, he, of course, Jones, the B, paid dearly for that that comment um, because we had an active women's caucus at the in the guild at that time, and we immediately filed a complaint, and and um, he had to apologize. And you know, that was also around the same time that we had filed the, I think it was the first one of the first sex discrimination complaints against a major newspaper in the country. Um, after I was prevented from entering the Sutter Club. Um, I think we talked about that during the last right. last interview. Could, could you maybe talk about how the Women's Caucus was formed? Hmm. You need to take the lead on that because <laughs> well, I came into it through a back, you know, gradually through the back door. Yeah, we well, had a lot of good men mm, as yeah. well as women advocates, and we were able to put together a caucus that really did a good job representing the newsroom. 
There was mm -hmm. power in there. It wasn't just a yeah. bunch of whiners or a bunch of people with one ax to grind. And that helped tremendously, I think, mm -hmm. over the years. Well, George and... Yeah. Um, George Williams and, and Jeff Raimondo was president of the, of the Guild at that right. time. Right, and, and Bill Glacken. Bill he Glacken, had lots of say in the, the newspaper. Wonderful arts critic. Writer. So we it was a good report. coalition, and, and I, it needs to be portrayed as a coalition. I think mm -hmm. um, well, we started with the you know the the women's movement model of a core committee of correct. five members so that not no one person would be um, the target the target although I usually was at some of the guild meetings um, there were some some very unsupportive men but yes. there were a lot who were like Glacken and and um, George Williams uh, Bob Forsyth who was became city editor and very active in the guild um, and um, we just started with we had a, the newsletter we had professional writing and and um, sometimes we didn't have bylines because the articles were controversial um, and there were people people were targeted but it was mainly a group of women and supportive men uh, who formed a, a women's caucus to deal with specific issues of portrayal um, and advancement opportunities and promotional this and, pejorative and, treatment of women. Pejorative treatment. Uh, you have some examples from right different levels. I mean, it was it was pervasive at the mm -hmm. time, and um, we were only in the newsroom when you became aware of where what went on in other levels at the B, such as sales, advertising. Um, they, the caucus involved <coughs> not just women in the newsroom, it also involved women at the Sacramento Union, Hillary Abramson right. um, and, and others. I mean, yeah. Media was a broad term and, and was meant well, that, to be. The, the uh, newsletter that we did was we f after we formed a media-wide organization, mm -hmm. we'd had so much success in the, in the women's caucus in the newspaper guild that we um, expanded it to Sacramento Women in Media, which included That's women right. in uh, uh, TV and you know broadcast media, uh, uh, academics. Um, there was some resistance to including women in PR. Yes, um, who had you know transitioned over. Then that was kind of regarded as the dark side. You don't hear that too so much, much anymore. anymore. But it was always, uh, what are you doing now? I've gone the, to the dark side. Right, reporters are moving back and forth, given the job opportunities in the news business and the staffing cutbacks. But we did, um, you know, incremental kinds of, we would take actions like change the name of the Guild's Man, it seems small. The Guild's Man was the newsletter of the Sacramento Newspaper Guild. And mm -hmm. we said, okay, can we just call it the Guild Reporter or something? Because, you know, the style issues referring to women as newsmen or, um, you know, any number of, of uh, style uh, you know, gender specific and then Iris gender neutral they would call it. And then Iris arrived with a copy of Stanford University guidelines for n neutral writing or writing about right, writing about women. Yeah, women and and th they were wonderful. We tried to get them adopted. Not going to happen for a long time. They finally did get adopted. I, th I don't remember well, they when. They adopted bits and bits pieces and pieces of it, as of they it, you know. wanted to, but. That was a well-studied academic uh, treatise that had been put out and all around the country um, on, you know, you can't call women chicks. You don't describe women in terms of their physical appearance. You right. don't describe them in terms of their um, sexuality, their hair color, their, right. you know, who they're married to. I mean, you know, news, oh, news was... style used to be Mrs. John Williams, right. you know, or, you know, they weren't. And even even late into the well into the eighties, uh, you know, the use of courtesy titles referring to women um, by their marital status. For a long time, it was Mrs. or Miss. Miss, and uh, the, just the absurdity of walking up to someone at an accident scene and saying, "By the way, do you prefer to be called Miss or and Mrs.?" You know, this is my this my story about <laughs> Justice Rose Byrd, Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court. And I was the medical writer at the time, and I had interviewed her about her breast cancer situation and being a working woman and what she was going through. And at the end of the interview, 
I had to ask her. I said, the B would like to use a courtesy title. We usually use Miss or Mrs. What would you like? And she said, Justice. <laughs> the New York Times still uses courte courtesy titles. Do they still? I In obituaries, I know they do. Yeah, I think they still do. Okay. And, I, um, they I were think, the last. And, that, I, and the Wall Street Journal. The reason know, I think it took so long to move off courtesy mm -hmm. titles was because the two old gray ladies, the Washington Post and the New York Times, continue to use them. Well, there's something to be said for courtesy titles, but when you're talking about referring to women by their marital status and not their professional status, you know, I mean, uh, with AP style, it's doctor on the first reference, but last name on second reference. Same with reverend or, you know, general or, you know, I mean, this we're, again, this is esoteric. <laughs> Uh, media stuff, um, but um, anyway, it was, you know, the caucus, we would meet with um, editors, we would talk to um, editors. I remember going down the hall with Nancy Skelton, down the hall, that was where the... the uh, Brass were down the, the hall. The opinion writers and the editorial board members, and uh, they were all, almost, they were all male at that time, all white male at that time. And was Ginger there yet? No, no. Ginger didn't come till much later, okay. Ginger Rutland. And, um, you know, I, he, he became a strong supporter of Jim Brown. He was an associate editor, had been a columnist, wonderful writer. But he written a column about the women's movement, something to the effect of, you know, forgive us for what we, we know not what we did or so, you know. And Nancy and I went down to, have a little chat with him, and, and um, I said, you know, and he understood, and he was extremely supportive after that. I mean, it was just kind of a patronizing column that was not really representative of who he was. So some of it was was bias, you know, just, old bias. Yeah, some, but some of what we did was just talking to people and reasoning mm -hmm. with them. Sometimes you were, would deal with people who were not reasonable. Uh, I mean, women, I think we talked about this last time, I don't want to repeat myself, but women couldn't wear pants to work, we couldn't wear no, slacks. We, we talked about that. And, um, you know, uh, <laughs> there were all, and there were, you know, uh, regular portrayals or AP photos. Remember the photos that ran page down the side two? on page two? Page two photos. And often they were, you know, Miss Australian Mink Skimpy. The skimpier, the better. And then we had conversations with the sports department um, remember, I mean, <laughs> because they would often run uh, sexist um, photographs and stories, and they didn't cover women's sports. It was, you know, it wasn't a legitimate topic. Um, and we also took legal action occasionally. Uh, there was an instance when um, Lee Smith, who was a caucus, active caucus member, and she had been essentially in a secretarial position. She was, she basically compiled the, the little vignettes that went in this column. And um, he was on, uh, uh, the man who wrote it, and I can't remember his name at this point, is, um, was on vacation. And they ran a little box in, on, in place of the column saying that it was being written by another reporter or something like that, basically admitting that, you know, she was doing the work of a reporter. And it was really enjoyable to go down to the personnel department and talk with Keith Fuller. He was the director of employee relations or something like that. And um, he knew that they'd done this in print, so they had to give her a promotion. They had to promote her to a... So that was, uh, you know, th that was easy. The um, uh, sex discrimination complaint that we filed after I was prevented from entering the Sutter Club, and the managing editor then ordered the city desk not to assign women to cover events in men's clubs, period. And we filed a complaint with the EEOC, I think it was one of the first in the country. And they sent an uh, investigator out who was just great, and she took the B apart. She went far beyond the requirements of the, the complaint. Uh, and. Um, you know, it directed major changes in advertising. They were, you know, advertising was was divided by sex and male and, advertisers and, could go out into the community and solicit ads for the bee. The female ad clerks sat inside the bee and took classified. them over the phone. Yeah, it wasn't just classified. It was any of the small ads. That's right. They were That's not right. in. The, 
the community. They didn't represent the bee outside the building. And so it was very definitely a gender line barrier there. They wouldn't let women do dis the, the big display ads, you know. They'd... Of course there weren't full support, there wasn't full support from women in the building. There wasn't full support from women in the community on women's rights and women's place and what women, you know, should be involved in. And so it, this was a time that was sort of the best of times and the worst of times. Things were changing, but many people were resisting, both within the company and outside the company. Um, I did a story one time about volunteerism and the fact that m many successes in the community had ridden on the backs of women who gave their time as volunteers for the hospitals, for other community organizations, and that that was free labor and it was out there and it was not, had not been recognized. The letters I got <laughs> over that simple story were, was amazing. People who felt they'd been insulted, that they had loved this community and had given their lives to the, building a better community. Mm -hmm. And how could they be insulted for taking unpaid work? And other people saying, I could never get a job. You know, I had to, no job opportunities because of all these volunteers who were taking the opportunities. It was a, I was fascinated at the amount of feedback that little story generated. Early in my career, I was nominated for a Penny Mo uh, Journalism Award, which is a fairly prestigious journalism award. Um, and I went down the hall to tell the editor that I'd been nominated. I was feeling very cocky and happy. And he said, well, you know, um, we don't encourage our reporters to participate in notoriety. <laughs> Something along those lines. And Reporters I said, Reporters report the news, they don't, don't make, make the, the news. news. And he said, You will have, if you go, you have to pay for it yourself. <laughs> and we would prefer that a member of the management team pick up the award. Well, and that was the, that was the message I was given. So back I went to my desk. Um, this is very harsh. He did not see it as harsh at all. I can understand. He wanted the management and the company to get the note, you know, known and to the accomplishments and have the spotlight on them, not on the individual reporter. So there were there were lots of very interesting hurdles that we had to climb over or through or under or somehow. Well, I remember working on a, in the early '70s, working on a series about because um, I was covering by then federal court and prisons and conditions of confinement cases, and they wanted to do a 20-part 20 a 20-part series on California prisons. And uh, I think Aaron was city editor that, that then, would and I think it was before Frank came in, but they wouldn't, you know, women did not, women reporters didn't go into the men's prison, so they sent me down to the, uh, the women's prison. There was one at that time in uh, Frontera near Chino, and um, the series won a major award, several major awards. Yes. The, the bee hadn't submitted them. They didn't have a PR department that no. did that. Um, and I remember getting a um, uh, note from the, you know, I had three stories in this 20-part <laughs> series. And uh, and so I had a part, small, I never saw the actual award, but, you know, it was the very hidebound, um, archaic institution. You know, the notion of, you know, you couldn't, when I first was told you couldn't write a weather story that said hot, and Unless, I believe it's 104 today. No, it had to be over 100 degrees for us to use the word hot in a weather story. I, I was told you just weren't supposed to use it at no, all. I was told it was over 100 degrees. Okay. Well, you know, it, it was pretty hot. I mean, yeah. I, any, but, you know, just silly things like that. And then substantively problematic issues like the references to women, references to people of color. Mm. Uh, there was, you know, no coverage of LGBTQ issues. Um, there was limited coverage. They had a policy against covering boycotts of any kind. I was working on a city desk, this is years later, late, maybe mid 70s. And um, if you were weekend city editor, you got a, a four day week. Of course, it meant you didn't have a weekend and you worked till two o'clock in the morning. But 
there was a, a major United Farm Workers uh, boycott going on, at, and they were picketing in front of Safeway. And my job as the weekend city editor was to uh, um, assign reporters. And so, but somebody on the copy desk, somebody told me oh, the bee doesn't cover boycotts. I said, "What? It's a news story." Right. Well, a lot of you know, a lot of that has has changed, and yes. there has been considerably more diversity at the B in more recent years. So we're we're talking about a time that was way, a long time ago. Although I, I, you know, when I re read stories about concern about you know being sure to tell both sides of a story um, and um, or multiple sides um, of a yeah, story. Well, there are mul usually multiple sides. And I remember being called in to the managing editor's office during the Pitt River Indian stories, and I had done a story on the history of the Pitt River Indian tribe, which was a history of annihilation and taking their land. And I got called. We had a sympathetic editor on the weekend who would slip these stories in on the weekend, George Williams, and then he'd get called in on Monday morning. And, and I remember the managing editor, who was really pretty sympathetic, um, you know, kind of, but he'd had orders from on high, um, saying, you know, this, this really only has one side to this story. And I mean, remember feeling really perplexed, like, you know, the other side is to support people, the annihilation of Native Americans in California. I, you know, I mean, it was just, it was a historical account. Well, this whole movement, both political and in other areas, gradually to be more inclusive, took a very long time and is still obviously in the news. I mean, we're still not there. And um, people are, are worried about losing their own privilege, I think. CK immediately hired Frank McCullough, um, who had been Time Life bureau chief in Vietnam, and was then, he'd gone back to the, uh, he became very disenchanted with the Vietnam War and did some really s seminal coverage about about the war, particularly when he got back to the States. From when, when he came back to New York from Saigon, mm -hmm. he was working in the New York office and he did that amazing series where they ran pictures of the young men who had died. They couldn't get them because from the they, military. Mm -hmm. They couldn't, um, they had to go to families, they had to go to school yearbooks, and they ran them every day, you know, and that really was regarded as a major factor in the end of the Vietnam War. So he was a, a very, uh, you know, forward-thinking editor. And I think he was at the LA Times when CK mm -hmm. called him. That's and the correct. LA Times yeah. was, in, was not the LA Times that it, it became later under Otis Chandler, but it was... Um, a it was very, a good paper and he was well-known and yeah. respected and respected for his coverage in Vietnam and other places. Mm -hmm. So CK deserves a lot of credit for bringing in McCullough and for changing a lot of the archaic practices that we've mentioned in the course of this wide-ranging interview. <laughs> so could we take a second to talk about, like, um, you've talked a little bit on different stories, but are there some stories, you've talked about the Pitt River, but that you felt you made a big, you know, that uh, for you were the major well, I had a little different thrust. I was not terribly political as a reporter. The areas that I covered were areas that were evolving in terms of change. Um, I, as Sigrid said, I did a lot of writing in healthcare. And at the time, one of the stories I covered was um, the Society for Humanized Birth, uh, which objected to the dehumanization of women in delivery and mm -hmm. in the hospital experience and how really kind of medieval and barbaric it was without anybody doing anything about it. And this organization worked hard to change those. And I wrote multiple stories about the issue itself, what could be done, what was being done, why it was or was not being done in terms of um, women in giving birth. And one of the things that had changed was finally they let a support person go in with a woman. So she was not just mm -hmm. um, sort of under the intimidation of medical personnel. Um, they allowed a parent in the room with the mother and the baby 
uh, in the first 24 hours. I, there was a big article I did about germs and the fact that the babies were going home to these germs. How could these germs be, you know, dangerous here and not so at home? And wouldn't it be anyway? So just trying to push some changes in the hospitals. And that was where it started, but it was all kinds of areas within the hospital trying to change things um, in terms of illness being brought into the hospitals. Who was checking? How was it checked? Where were the germ lady here? Uh, anyway, so I did some of those stories. Um, I did some sto other stories. Most of the stories that I did were um, either healthcare, trying to move healthcare in some directions, but that wasn't it. I, I kind of believe that a reporter looks around the community and sees what's mm -hmm. changing. Where is the noise? What's, who's behind the noise? What's it coming from? And trying to explain the noise to the people who are not yet a part of it. And, and I very much was interested in that aspect of reporting. So I actually liked some of the stories that I did over the years that weren't really hard, hard news, but which brought social change to the conscience and to the fore. Um, I was lucky enough to spend a year and a half doing um, reporting on the impact of the Indo-Chinese refugees in the state of California and in Northern California. And that actually got split up. Lee Fremstead, who was a friend of CK, of, um, Frank McCullough's did the statewide implications, the political side, mm -hmm. and I did the social side. And um, the schools all of a sudden had multiple languages in their classrooms and had didn't know how to deal with it. What was happening to those children? Um, the whole thing with healthcare and the Vietnamese, there were, they had none. Um, the whole refugee issue, while the, the Indo-Chinese refugees were you know, a microvision of that. <laughs> All refugees were facing it if they came, and still are. Mm -hmm. um, there is no care, there is no help, there is no transitionary support outside of, the, at the time it was the churches. And I look around at the, what's happening right now with Ukraine, and again, it's the communities that are already here that are bringing the others forward, and that happened there. So. Well, those yeah. kinds of human stories. Right, I mean, and that's the what I had prefer tended to do. in the past to be very agenda driven, you know. I mean they, the fact that local journalism local government is hardly being covered anymore, you know. I mean we covered <laughs> I covered meetings, local government <laughs> meetings and court hearings and Ann and I both covered education and health care and you know, you may have to go to these long, boring meetings. <laughs> Uh, but you often find stories there. One of my you know? favorites um, was um, I was covering local governments, city councils, that kind of things. And the police chief in Ialton and his carry permit on guns. Hmm. And that became a huge story for yes, me for a short time. Mm -hmm. And then it became a story later on. Yeah. Same story. And I'm thinking... Oh. But I wrote this 12 years ago. How can it be? Mm -hmm. It was a number of years ago. So what she's saying is you go into these meetings and you don't expect anything. And you, amazing stories would come out. One of my stories that I did had to do with the San Juan Unified School District. And I would cover their board meetings regularly. Mm -hmm. And they had, and they always set the last item on their agenda was um, community input. At midnight? At midnight. Yeah. The most contentious stuff had to wait till most people were so tired they couldn't take 10 more minutes and went home. And I actually wrote the story about why didn't they put it up front? Mm. Why was it at midnight that, Good question. that parents got a chance to speak and never any other time? And that brought the ire <laughs> down on my head, from but the, it was a, those are the kind of stories that I was interested in, you know, changing. Well, I remember covering um, the um, Sac City, a Sac City Unified School Board meeting, and I, you know, they, they were doing these reports on suspensions and expulsions, and this is all pre-internet, so yes. these are these long <laughs> written reports, and I'm looking, studying them during this long, boring meeting, I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, I want to learn about 
the stories behind these numbers and the reality was and it's true today, yeah, today. is that the suspensions and expulsions were mostly children of color especially black boys and young men and it was a terrible system it's you know there's since been laws passed to rectify that although it hasn't been and the um, justifications were amazing but talking to the people you know talking to the families that takes you know, when I was teaching at Sac State, and I'd tell students, you know, you've got to, you, now that you know, ten, there's sometimes a tendency to think you, you know, can write, do all your research online. You've got to get out there. You've got to go talk to people. There's right. a lot of research you can do online, but you have to find the, the examples, parents, the, the people who are living it. The school, you know, and, and it was the same when I was covering conditions in the state mental hospitals, and I've covered mental health issues. For a very long time, I continued to do that for Capital Weekly, which is an online news service, and um, for other, I've done it for other magazines, but it started at the B when I happened to be there one evening um, working on a story, and this woman came in and walked into the newsroom, which she, she had come up through the staircase through the composing room, Barely, which was yeah. not, I don't know how she even yeah. found it, but she was really angry and she had pictures of her six-year-old son who was a resident they didn't call him patients they called resident at stockton state hospital and he was a little blonde blue-eyed cherub looking boy she had before and after pictures like a school picture he was the term then was mentally retarded the term now is developmentally disabled and um, that was the primary population at stockton state hospital at that time we ended up, you know, I got on the phone, McCullough was managing editor by then, and we ended up running those pictures on page one, which just, you know, elicited a torrent of phone calls. And I would, you know, you had to call people. You, you, people were taking a huge risk, the people oh, who to worked talk, in, these, yeah. in these places. There was some retaliation. Mm -hmm. uh, the administration it, initially, this was... Um, right about at the beginning of the Brown administration, he did then appoint Dr. Jerome Lackner right. and brought in Ray Precunier, who had been the head of the state prison system, and I knew quite well, to conduct a statewide investigation of um, suspicious deaths in state hospitals. And it was a remarkable investigation, so I covered that over a period that of about was five, three or four years, and I've continued to do it since um, I was going to say that's still a story that, that yeah. whole closure of the state hospitals mm -hmm. and the lack of protective um, mindset in those hospitals as opposed to a punitive one is, is fascinating how that yeah. evolved in it well the hospitals were terrible I mean I saw terrible things there in, were in these terrible hospitals. things yes and and there were people who died who should not have died or people who should have been, been prosecutions there. And, and some people were terminated I don't think there was ever a, an actual prosecution although I remember calling one DA's office every week you know to see what have you decided to do with this case and because they had done a very thorough investigation in the, in the state it was then the state health department at that time it's since been broken up but there was never any provision for um, community care. There has been the budget was removed. Yeah, the, the, I mean, it was basically the, it, the hospitals were decimated. They were and understaffed. but the proposal was the legislation that passed. Lanham and Petrus Short mm -hmm. said that the state hospitals failed, and they felt that community-based care was the right way to go, so that individuals be could be close to the community, close to family, close to things that they knew and receive care on a more individualized basis. Sounds good. Problem was that Doesn't a exist. particular governor, Ronald Reagan, removed all of the funding for the local community treatment programs. And so it never existed there as Sigurd pointed out to me the other night there are still regional care centers well and that's come back but it the whole vision that was there for what how we would change things well the regional center system was set up um, in response to complaints from parents like this woman who came to right. the B. With development um, a developmentally disabled children and young adults um, and older adult, adults who did and Latterman, Frank Latterman, one yeah. of the authors of Latterman Pet Short, Short, which put very strict limitations on 
any kind of involuntary hospitalization because of the abuse in the hospitals. He wrote the legislation that created, helped to create the, the regional center system so that developmentally disabled people are placed in community facilities. There was never a similar system set up, and a lot of Mentally people are Ill. talking now, Daryl Steinberg among them, um, who was the author of the Mental Health Services Act in the legislature, um, and Prop, Prop, which was passed as Prop 63, um, you know, to set up a similar system for the, the lines. mentally ill. And, you know, now we have the Governor, Governor Newsom's care court proposal, you know, the homelessness issue, the uh, large numbers of mentally ill people on the streets. The, the lines are not that clear, unfortunately, on who is mentally ill mm. and who is developmentally mentally ill. Disabled, and then there's substance abuse, and then and there's substance abuse, so, which also co causes mental disintegration over time and in the moment. So the lines have never been absolutely clear as to whether you can segregate these populations to get different care facilities set up for them. So it, it is a problem that has not gotten better over well, this, the years. Uh, the B did a, a, a Melinda Hennenberg, I think she's the new columnist, Pulitzer mm -hmm. Prize winner. The B's oh, hiring that, some that story just really this weekend, good yeah. people, you know, um, and they're doing, they're still doing some really excellent coverage. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, co the cover article. She's a columnist, opinion writer, um, about a man. And I have seen hundreds of articles about this case because he is is has um, traumatic brain injury as a result of a motorcycle accident. He doesn't fit in neat little categories, and if he didn't have sisters who are going out on the street. To take care to... of him. So, you know, I mean, this is an issue that is being debated as we speak because the governor's care court proposal is on its way through the legislature now, and there's been tremendous blowback from disability rights organizations yes. who are concerned about Getting swept up into a classification. Uh, and that's concerned about involuntary treatment right. and the fact that the treatment, I mean, all, the best treatment obviously is voluntary. And, um, you know, but there are people who think, you know, it's called anisognosia. They don't believe they're sick and they can, right. they're countless in the jails and prisons. It's not accidental that I covered courts and jails and prisons and then segued over to state mental hospitals because the you know the jails and prisons are now often referred to as the new asylum to funnel you know and the mentally ill population I uh, there's a judge in Santa Clara County that you know many of the counties including Sacramento have mental health courts those are on the criminal side what the governor's proposed, what Newsom is proposing on care court is um, on the civil side, which is similar to Laura's law, but this is all very complicated yes. and we don't want to get into all the, all the weeds there. But um, the criminal court, the ju judges in the criminal courts, you know, they, don't, they say, I interviewed a judge the other day who's one of the pioneers on the mental health courts. These are efforts to keep people out of, you know, get them into treatment rather than uh, jail. sitting in jail and he said I have I've issued orders for people to be released and there's nowhere for them to go the state hospitals are backlogged um, you know there's a woman who Melinda profiled in her column that I've interviewed many times she lives in Carmichael and her she's been trying to get treatment for her daughter who's in her 30s um, and has, has been on the streets she's uh, uh, has an epileptic condition, and she's also, um, I believe it's schizoaffective disorder, does not believe she's sick, has been homeless on the streets, can't get any kind of treatment, can't get her into a uh, um, treatment beyond a 72-hour hold, or perhaps a 14-day hold under Landerman Petra Short. The law has literally not changed since 1967. And whenever there's an effort in the legislature, Newsom has made it quite clear he doesn't want to make any changes in Lannerman Petrus Short, but he's proposing other other changes that are gaining a lot of a lot of credence, particularly at the local local level. But you know, so major stories. Um, well, Anna well one I, of the things that I did that I covered, um, I covered science and medicine, and. This was a time of tremendous social upheaval, but it was also a time of tremendous scientific um, 
change in this country and around the world. And I had the opportunity to write a number of stories about, oh, with NASA, about things that were developing that would affect us later as the economy, I mean, as the uh, planet temperature changes. Um, and things like CAT scans were brand new. Nobody ever knew what they were. I'm not going in that tube, no, not me. So I was able to explain what the CAT scans were, the difference between a PET scan and a CAT scan, and whether you wanted or, you know, and trying to give people information about new things that were coming on board that would affect their lives. And one of the things that I wrote about um, <laughs> was the, I left just about the time it got going, was the introduction of the HMO mm. and Alan Entoven at Stanford. Repaid health plans, yeah. Yeah, who was the economist who kind of introduced this. And just looking at the economic model, I was shocked. And yet I also realized that the model it was in was going to bankrupt the country and preserve health care for the rich. And I still think that is a huge story yes. that is not covered and not being covered well. I think the HMOs have now, in my mind, failed in a number of areas and really need to change. Well, but nobody's it, bringing it forward or dealing with it. Um, the nonprofit model, which is, you know, Kaiser, and of course, they're... Well, their weights are un... The, yeah, Believable. Very under very strict supervision by the state, and one of the largest fines in state history uh, for their lack of mental health care. And, and their, their mental health people are out on the street on the again, stri uh, out striking right now. Um, and it is true. If you go in as a Kaiser patient and ask for a mental health care provider because some you're really worried about yourself, they will tell you. Um, well, we don't have anyone available right now. You can go sit in the clinic and wait. And that's not just Kaiser. I mean, no, that happens. No, it's all not over. just Kaiser. I mean, people who are detained on a 72 can, hour hold, right. you know, they may sit in the emergency right, room and right. never be seen. Or, or go you know. on the web pages. How many mentally ill people have access to the web pages and pick a psychiatrist from our long list? most of whom are really not taking any new patients. It's not a good system. I mean, there were, there were other stories that were in a rate. It's, it's about money. It's about money. I ended up doing a lot of coverage of Prop 13, mm -hmm. which changed the tax rate for homes. And, and what it really did was cut the, back the money. the schools. On, well, public services, schools, zoos, water <laughs> delivery on public services. And, you know, those kinds of stories don't make a huge uh, dent at the time. They, they're all political, but you have to look at the impact of one side and the other. What What is going to happen and what did happen? And that's a, a tragic thing. I, well, I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion now about the role of the media, and I define the media, you know, perhaps in different ways than some people do. There are some... Uh, partisan websites, um, Fox News among among them, that are not <laughs> journalism. I mean, no, you know, their opinion. And the role of journalism in uh, in a democracy. It sounds trite, but it's more important than ever. And um, you know, stories that can have an impact, that can affect change. Um, I mean, you don't go into it with the notion I'm going to you know change, change the, the world. That's uh, going to get you and have run up against barriers every time if you take that attitude. Well, you're you can run perhaps change a small part of it. And but, that I know, think the, setting out to change something is not the right beginning yeah. point. The right beginning point is, as I said earlier, what I call community noise. Mm -hmm. What is going on? What is riling people up? What are people n having problems with? That that's what started the hospital series about women in birth and, and some of the draconian kinds of things that were done, um, is there are groups now that are upset about those issues. There really needs to be, you know, checks and balances on it so you're not pushing one agenda and not ever showing the counter side of that. Well, and Anne was also doing some of this coverage at the same time that we were working to get more um, 
there was no maternity leave. I mean, we both had our children around the same time, and you had to paste together a you know, pastiche of sick leave and, and vacation time, and then they would, in personnel, they'd try to get you to, you know, basically sign a piece of paper saying you weren't coming back. Uh, I mean, you know, and we, we won't use it in, if you do, but we have it here in case we want to get rid of you. Mm, yeah, and um, now, in fact, I remember Frank McCullough was managing editor at the time, and we, Ann and I both had young children, and we were <laughs> trying to get, doc, get an employer sponsored childcare program, you know, and near the B, which eventually did happen. And, and you know, he was, Frank was supportive, other managers were supportive. We worked really hard on that. Basically, we would have had to do it ourselves. <laughs> really oh, hard on yeah. that. And I remember the thing that I absolutely loved is, as Sigrid said, there finally was a mm. child care center so that women could go, go off and report the stories when the stories happened. If there was a mm. bomb up there and you need to go at 11 o'clock at night, you need to go at 11 o'clock at night. You know, and you may or may not have someone who can take care of your children. There was a child care center and I said to my son, Justin, would you like to go see the new child care center opening at the B? <laughs> and he said, shall I drive, mom? <laughs> you know, it's always been like that. The, the cruelty, the retribution towards people trying to tell their side of the story, the getting two sides of the story listened to in an honorable way is a fight that goes on and has been there, you know, off and on for ever.